Hey guys, welcome to Oasis Church and thanks for tuning in. My name is Pastor Brady and this is my wife Renita. We're so glad you joined us today. Our prayer is that your faith and your heart will be strengthened as you listen to the word. God bless you as you listen. Now we've got, um, we got a few more of those next week. So we're going to have a couple baptisms next week as well. And then I think uh, we might even have another one next month. Don't worry, we'll change the water out before that. Um, I want to introduce our speaker this morning, uh, a dear, dear friend of mine, um, a mentor in some way, someone that I've looked up to uh, for a number of years. Um, not that we've had coffee every week, but just, you know, you got those heroes that you, that you hang out with all the time, and then you got those that are a little bit far off, but you can still see them. They're kind of setting the pace. Well, that's Chris Dowd for me. Uh, he planted Bedrock Church um, as the uh, lead uh, pastor of preaching, or at least he is now. And, and uh, him and John G. Tate went in uh, together on that about the same time that uh, Pastor Bubba planted Oasis Church. So about, was it 16 years ago? Something like that? Whew, gone like that, right? And um, Chris has also been a tremendous encouragement to Monica. He is over the church planting efforts at Liberty University. And, um, but he's still a pastor at Bedrock because uh, you can never take that part out, right? And, uh, and I asked him probably a long, like a year ago, whatever, and brother's just been busy. He was just like, I called him one time. He was like, I'm in Argentina or where, I don't know, you were somewhere overseas. And then he did it again. He was like in Florida or something. So, I mean, he's getting it done for the kingdom, but he's been an encouragement to Monica. He works across the hall from you, right? In that, that big tower thing at, uh, at Liberty. And, um, and he was kind enough to come and bring the word. I'm super stoked to sit under the word with him this morning. Would you guys make him feel welcome? Pastor Chris Dowd. Come on. All right, bro. Bring it. Hey. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Wow. This is so exciting for me. Um, I think Monica and I talked about this um, when uh, Bubba and Nedra were getting started. They were helping us unload a trailer at Liberty High School in Bedford going, how do you do this and what's going on? We're like, we don't know. We're trying to figure it out, too. And We'll tell you what we know so far, uh, and hope it helps. And so um, for this moment to happen, knowing that we were unloading a trailer together at Liberty High School, I don't even know, 15 years ago now with them, um, is amazing. And to see Brady, goodness gracious, this young man is just on fire. You guys are blessed uh, to have this team up here and to be a part of this. And so I'm honored. I'm humbled to be here today. Um, but uh, Brady asked me to... Um, uh, break off a piece of the word today. And so uh, I need to go ahead and get to that uh, aspect of what we're doing today. Now, I don't know that I could preach a better message than what you just heard. It reminds me of Adrian Rogers. Of uh, There might be people that can preach the gospel better than I can, but no one can preach a better gospel than we have. And you just saw the transformation of the gospel in a young man's life. And that message from the water is as great of a message as, as you can hear. I am so grateful that we get to preach the greatest message of all time, which is the gospel. So it's my aim to do that today. It's my goal as a, as a preacher of this to simply say what God's already said. And so we're going to get into it. Before we do, let me ask this question. Anybody here play golf? Any golfers in there? I got a couple. All right. I didn't know. Uh, I got I to gotta figure out where I'm at. I got to get my bearings straight with me. So I'm a, I'm a golfer. I enjoy it quite a bit. So um, if you're not a golfer, you probably know, at least know that gear to play golf is not cheap. This is not a cheap hobby playing golf, right? There's a great course right up the road here, by the way. Poplar Grove, really nice, right? And so you go and play, but you spend a lot of money on equipment. And so I'm down in Florida when Brady, uh, with one of our church plants down there uh, in Sarasota. There's a bedrock in Sarasota. And a young man down there named Blake Harkup, Blake and Kelsey are leading that church. So we're down there to love on them and spend some time with them and to take them out to play golf because Blake likes to play golf. So we bought some gear, but we only have a couple golf balls, and, you know, we spent some money on some nicer golf balls. And then comes this moment where we're sitting on a tee, and I'm not going to say who, but my son Jonathan, who's here with me today, was playing with us, and myself, and Blake, and my father, who lives in Lakeland, Florida, is playing with us. So, so we're, we're teeing up. I put down, I've only got a handful of these balls now. I'm, we, we have traveled to Florida, and we went to Walmart, bought some golf balls. So I got this golf ball. One of us to protect the guilty, I will not say their name, hits one of these balls. It goes like a banana to the right and, and possibly 
strikes a house that's on this golf course, okay? I will, again, not mention the name to protect the guilty in this moment. What happens is, in between us and this ball that we don't have very many of, and we spend some money at Walmart for these balls, stands uh, this swampy area in Florida. Now, if I say swamp in Florida, what immediately pops into your brain? Gators, right? So now I've got some trees, some high weeds, which might be hiding some snakes of some sort, swamp and a potential gator, and maybe somebody with a shotgun whose house just got hit by this ball. We have to make a determination. Is this a hill upon which to die, right? Because between here and there is possible death, right, in many levels. And we go, you know what? I don't know that we need that golf ball that bad. We'll figure it out. We'll survive, right? We, you make a decision, is it worth it, right? You say, why in the world are you talking about this? I, I feel like in our day and age today, we have to have a conversation about this book. And we have to have a conversation of, is this a hill upon which to die? Because the conversations about whether or not these are God's words or not is under attack. And we have to make a decision. Is this something that's really important to us or just kind of important to us? Does it matter to me? Does it impact me? Does it impact Oasis Church? Does it impact my family, my life? Is this a hill upon which to die? I'm going to say to you today, I had one chance to preach one message here. Brady was like, man, you can preach whatever you want. If I get one chance, I'm talking about this. This is so, so near and dear to my heart. And I want to share a passage with you as we get started just to introduce this concept. And then we're going to dive into our main passage. This isn't our main passage, uh, but I want to look at together 2 Timothy chapter 3. So if you'll turn there with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want to introduce this concept uh, with some words. I'm going to teach you some words. I'm going to put on my Dr. Dow, Dr. Brennan, Liberty, School of Divinity Tower hat for just a minute, and we're going to talk about some words. And I promise you this will be the most seminary level part of this message, and, and then we'll move beyond. But here's the idea. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Here's what it says. As for you, Paul's talking to Timothy, he says, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. How many of you know that he learned it from his mama and from his grandmother? That's, there's something to that. So to see a grandfather baptizing his grandson, right? So knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Let's not scoot past that too quickly because I want you to understand something this morning. The sacred writings that's being referred to is the first half of this thing that you have. And apparently in the Old Testament, there's enough in there to make Timothy wise unto salvation to be saved. Now, not just be saved, saved through faith. Not just saved through faith, but faith in Christ Jesus. In the Old Testament? Absolutely. There's something special about this book. And it says this sacred writing is able to make you wise unto salvation. Why? Because all Scripture, everybody say all Scripture. All, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Now, that's either true or it's not true. We're going to have a conversation today about that. If that's not true, you have every right to question everything in this book. If it is true, that's a game changer. So let's talk about it. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, there's a lot being said there, so here's your seminary lesson for the day. Promise you we'll do this quick and we'll move on. Here's the thing. The Word of God is inerrant. Now, that's a big word. Inerrant. You say, well, what does that word mean? It means without error. Good job. In, without error. 
errant error. It means there's no errors in that. You say, why do you say that? Well, it says that these sacred writings were able to do this. They are sacred. They are holy. They are different. They are unique. There's something set apart about these writings. They are without error. They are holy. They are set apart. They are inerrant. And what that means is, you say, well, do I have a, or every one of these things? Here's what that means. So now let me give you the, the bedrock. This is the Bedford, Virginia, now Oasis version. That just means that they're true in all that they say. Everything found here is 100% true. Okay? And if that's true, then they are also infallible. Here's another big word. If inerrant means without error, then infallible means without fallible. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? That means without fallacy. That means without the possibility of being wrong. So what's that mean? That means that they're trustworthy. So when you hear inerrancy and infallibility, here's what they're saying. It's 100% true and trustworthy. Do you and I have an absolutely true and trustworthy source in our possession? That's the question for today. So if it's inerrant and it's infallible, then it says they were able to make him wise. So if I have a 100% true and trustworthy source, then it has the ability to impact my life, meaning it should have authority in my life. What that means is in this moment, even though I'm standing behind this pulpit, listen to me, I am not over the scripture. The scripture is over me. It has the authority. Why? Because it's true and trustworthy. You don't know me. You're like, I don't know if I can trust a word coming out of this guy's mouth. The most accurate things and the greatest things you'll hear me say today is when I open my mouth and read this book. Okay? It's true, it's trustworthy, and so it should have authority in my life. If this true and trustworthy book has authority in my life, then that makes it relevant. Right? It says it's able, it's profitable to you. That means there's stuff in here that I need that's good for me to live the life that God's called me to live. And this profitable book is able to make me complete, perfect, equipped for every good work. It means it's sufficient for all that I need. So is it possible that the creator of the universe, who spoke the world into existence, is able to give me a true and trustworthy source that should carry weight in my life, that's relevant to me today as the day it was written, and it's sufficient for all that he wants me to do? We believe the answer to that question is 100% yes. But it all hinges on one particular phrase. All of this is only true if these words are God-breathed words. If they're not God-breathed coming out of the mouth of God, then maybe they're not all true. And if they're not all true, then maybe it's not trustworthy. And if it's not trustworthy, then it shouldn't carry too much authority in my life, much less be relevant or sufficient to everything that I need. You see that? So everything hinges on the inspiration of Scripture. So I want to have a conversation today, not just about inerrancy and infallibility and the authority of Scripture and the relevancy of Scripture and the sufficiency of Scripture, but about the inspiration of Scripture. Because that's either true or it's not. This morning, I want to show you why you can have and believe firmly and live a life with a true and trustworthy copy of God's Word in your lap, okay? So, having said all that, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. If you've got an app, you got it on a tablet, you got it on your phone, whatever you have where you can see the Word of God, it's going to be very, very important for me today for you to see the Word of God in the message today, not hear the words from some guest preacher that Brady said he likes this guy, um, that knows Bubba and Nedra, that knows Monica. That's, that doesn't... I want you to hear and see the words of God today. So let me pray for us. Pray for me that I would simply say what God's already said in His Word and that it would land on open and receptive hearts today. Would you pray with me as we get started? God, thank you so very, very much for today. It's the day you've made, so we rejoice, we're glad in it, and God, in this day, we get to look at your word today. It is perfect. It is true. It is trustworthy. It should carry some weight in my life. It's relevant in 2023. 
All of it. Old Testament and New Testament. And it's sufficient. And so, Father, I pray that you would help me to simply communicate and say what you've already said. Father, illuminate your word by your Holy Spirit to us today. And may we respond in faith and obedience to what you have said. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Peter chapter 1. Are you ready? If you're ready, say amen. Oh, here we go. I'm about to break off a piece of the word, Brady. Second Peter chapter 1. Here's what it says. For we, this is, uh, I'm beginning in verse 16. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. How many of you were here last week when Brady preached on Matthew chapter 17, transfiguration, right? I said, what's next? He goes, Matthew 18. What did you just preach? Matthew 17, and we talked about transfiguration. I'm like, oh, You know, Peter talks about that. He says, I was with him when Jesus was normal, and then Jesus was glowing, like something happened crazy on this mountain. Notice what Peter says next. We were with him on the holy mountain, the passage from last week, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Now, this is mind-blowing. When you first read this, you go, I'm sorry, say what? Peter says, I'm telling you, I was there when it happened, and we have something now more trustworthy than what I saw with my eyes in that moment. That's crazy. Peter, you were there. Yep. You know for sure, for sure, I'm telling you. And I'm telling you, we have something even more sure than that. To which... We would do well to pay attention. (laughs) If I've got something more sure than that, we should probably pay attention to it, is what he says. Why? Because it's like a lamp shining in a dark place, a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts, until Jesus comes again, I need something to lead me and guide me. Has God given me something to lead me and guide me until Jesus comes again to get me? Yes, he has. Is it more sure than even Peter's eyewitness account? Yes, it is. What is it? Knowing this, first of all, this is only true if, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever, ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. There it is. There it is. How do I know these aren't just a bunch of men's words written down at some point? Peter says, I'm telling you, we have something more sure than that because these words are the words of God. What does that mean, God breathed? It means they wrote them down as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Great question. Let's find out together, okay? So let's break down this passage together. In 2 Peter chapter 1, there's three things I want you to learn this morning, and it's this. Number one, the word of God is more trustworthy than what we hear or read. If this is true and trustworthy... And Peter says, I'm telling you, it's more sure, it's more trustworthy than, well, then what? Number one, the word of God is more trustworthy than what we hear or read. You see, why do you say that? Go back to our passage. Here's what it says in the text. Peter says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There were a lot of myths in Peter's day. A lot of things said that just weren't true. A lot of opinions out there. And some were considering the story of Jesus and the resurrection a myth. Voice born from heaven, baptized, and a dove came and rested on her shoulder, and some voice said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. And he climbs a mountain and starts glowing in the dark. Those are myths. And Peter's like, I'm telling you, we were there. So he's given this eyewitness account to contradict the, the teachings that were going on, that all of this is just a big story. 
And mythology was not something foreign to this context and this culture. They were in a very Greek-Roman context, and there's a lot of Greek mythology. We talk about it today, and we, we put them in superheroes and movies, and we, we understand that there are stories of things out there. A myth simply means a story not based in fact. It's a mere literary character invented for some mythological narrative, and that's, they were trying to get Jesus in that idea. Pagan mythology of the day, you even see it represented in the New Testament. There's references to Artemis, the Greek god of fertility, to Zeus. Barnabas was called Zeus. Paul was called Hermes. There's all kinds of Greek mythology taking place. And then you get uh, Paul in Athens, and there are Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. That just sounds really, really important. Like, what's Epicurean Stoic? I don't even know that they knew what that meant. It just sounds really important. And there would be people in Athens who gathered in a circle called the Areopagus who would just talk philosophy stuff. And, well, we're Stoic philosophers. Well, good for you. What are you? I'm an Epicurean philosopher. What else? We just wax philosophical and use big words and talk all day long. So this idea was very commonplace. And you're like, oh, here we go. You said the seminary class was over, but please tell me right now you're going to start teaching philosophy 101. Well, I'm not. There are some in the room right now, like half the room is just like, yes, let's dig deep. Some of you are like, go back to the golf illustration. Like, what was that about? Right? So I understand. We talk about this all the time at Bedrock. We are teaching to the PhD and the ADD every Sunday, right? <laughs> so I get it, all right? So here's the PhD moment. You're like, ah, are we going to talk about Descartes and Locke and Spinoza and Hume and Kant and Kierkegaard and Bultmann and please say Nietzsche just to say Nietzsche because it sounds cool? Like, what are we, are we talking about pantheism or naturalism or philosophical agnosticism or idealism or postmodern relativism or materialism? And ah, this is not the moment. Some of you are like, can you please hurry up because the latest Jordan Peterson video was on YouTube and I want to go home and watch it. We don't lack for voices to listen to or books to read today to help you form your opinion of who God really is. In our world, in our day and age today, we need something that no matter how many really, really smart voices, they sound so good. Is there any source that would always be true that I can measure them up against, that they're either right or wrong based upon some basic standard of truth? Is there anything like that? It's more trustworthy than anything you will read or hear on TikTok or YouTube or wherever you are. I need that. And the God of the universe says, I want to give that to you. So we have something like this. Look at Psalm 19. That's what it says in Psalm chapter 19, describing this. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing in the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. If you say, man, you say inerrancy and infallibility, and I'm just like, what do you mean? It means this. I need something that's perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. Is there a source of that? Yes. The Word of God is all of those things. And in our world today, we need a source that's louder than the noise, that's pure and sure and enlightens our eyes to truth. And we have that. Let me say this. Um, my friend Johnji, we planted church together called Bedrock Community Church. Uh, he likes to farm. And he, I, I had the golfers in one deal. So let me ask us, anybody here have a garden? You like to farm a little bit? All right, I got, all right, here's the rest. All right, I'm getting more people leaning in, all right? So he was driving down the road and noticed a guy that had some tomatoes growing differently, okay? Now, I would just keep on rolling. Johnji's like, I'm going to stop and ask the dude. I'm like, well, of course you would, because you're Johnji. And so he pulls up in the yard, and here he comes. A farmer Joe, or whatever his name was, comes out, and he says, man, I noticed your tomatoes. Apparently, you can grow them on a trellis. I didn't know. 
you got a system here. It's pretty awesome. How do you grow tomatoes? Well, we've been growing tomatoes like this for many, many years. And my daddy and my grandpappy and we all have grown tomatoes this way. And everybody knows we have the best tomatoes in the valley. And there are, we produce the tomatoes every year. And we just hang them on this. And we got a drip irrigation. And John G's like taking crazy notes, right? Because he's going to go home to Bedford and do exactly what this guy said. Right? Now, so he's telling me this story, and in my brain, because I'm a, I'm a skeptical thinker, I'm a systems guy, I'm a think first, jump second, third, maybe fourth, fifth, after I've come up. Some of y'all get me, right? John G is a jump first, think fifth, maybe. Um, and so we work really well together. We're a good team. And so in my brain, uh, I'm also, uh, oh, this might, this might lose half the room. I also, well, oh, we're too close. I didn't think about this one. I am a Virginia Tech hokey. Um, anybody? All right. My sister is in the house. Virginia Tech has a pretty good agricultural school. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm sure Farmer Joe's got a great system, but what if I sent Professor, the Dr. Brennan of agriculture for the Virginia Tech school to Farmer Joe? And he would be like, well, <clears throat> let me see what you've got here. This is very good. Uh, let me take a couple of soil samples and put them into my computer and my database back home and have my research team take a look at it. And uh, here's what we've determined. Uh, technically, you're doing well. However, uh, if you would choose to water three times a day instead of twice and an hour early, you would produce, uh, we believe, 20% uh, larger uh, harvest of tomatoes in the fall, and then they would be 10% more red, and uh, the juice factor would be exponentially, and he's going, <laughs> right? And you're like, okay, you're just a really smart tomato dude, right? <laughs> I would probably want to do it the way that Virginia Tech professor, doctor, whoever said to do so. Or, so you've got Farmer Joe, you've got Dr. Professor, whoever guy. Or, it's going to sound crazy, the creator of the tomato. Who looks down and says, well, that's adorable. You're so close. You're so close, but not quite, right? Like, if I could talk to, well, I just know this person's really good, and he's always been good, or I could talk to Dr. Brennan and Dr. Dowd, who work in this tower at Liberty University, or the author of the only true and trustworthy source that we have. I'm going there. We can have a relationship and an audience with a guy who wrote a book who breathed out words. And according to Numbers chapter 23, it is impossible for God to lie. Look at this. God is not man that he should lie. Apparently, we're good at that. We're known for that. Or the son of man that he should change his mind. We're really good at that too. He has said it, will he not do it? He has spoken, will he not fulfill it? God doesn't lie. He doesn't change his mind. Thus, the words that he produces are without error and completely trustworthy. They're eternal. My words are not. My words cannot change your life. His words can. Brady, I'm getting a little excited. Bruh, I, am, I got two more points. Are y'all ready? Here we go. His word is more trustworthy than what we hear or read. The word of God is also more trustworthy than what we experience or feel. Hmm. You say, how do you say that? Go back to our text. This is, again, this is not my opinion. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Peter says, we did not come at you with some cleverly devised myths. And by the way, there are a lot of cleverly devised myths in our world today. It sounds so good. It's just a cleverly planned out and devised lie. The enemy is a punk, and he's really good at disguising lies. Then he says this, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. This is crazy. I saw it with my own eyes. When he received honor and glory from God the Father, when the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm telling you, I was there. I heard those things said. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. You can't have a better experience or feeling than I have had. I'm Peter. 
I was there when it happened. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I was at the event. And what I felt in that moment and in that room, whoo. And Peter says, we have something even more trustworthy than that. You see, there are some questioning Peter's eyewitness account. You didn't see that. What do you think you saw? Who else was there? You heard what? I don't know about that. I don't know that you saw what you think you saw or heard what you think you heard. So they're questioning Peter. Peter's like, I'm telling you, I was there. We heard it. It was this kind of stuff. He said, but I'm also telling you that even if all that stuff wasn't true, we have something even more sure than my eyewitness account. If you don't trust me, fine, then trust this. Matthew 24 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. You know the things about circumstances and feelings? They do what? They change. I need a source of truth that does not change by every wind and wave that blows through. I can feel one way today, and I can feel something different tomorrow. That's just the way that it is. So I need something that doesn't change like feelings do. Um, here's the thing. Some of you this morning, um, now I'm going to get the rest of the room. I've been trying to get different rooms. Here, I'm going to get everybody out this one. How many of you, before you came here this morning, looked in the mirror to get ready for this moment? Right. Yeah, you did something. You were like, well, before I get in the car, hold on real quick. Some of you have checked it since you got here. I mean, you're, you are, you're trying to figure it out, okay? Um, some of you obviously did not. Uh, and you, <laughs> listen, you know who you are. It's okay. Hey, listen, you be you. You know, it's fine. Some of you, uh, like me, worked very, very hard to get every hair perfect. I worked hard. You, you, you understand what I'm talking about. I, I, you get me, right? <laughs> we spent a lot of time working on our hair this morning right? I, I do use product in my hair, for those of you that are curious. It's called SPF, right? Because that's, you, you don't want this out in the sun for too long, right? So here's the thing. The thing about mirrors is this. Mirrors don't lie, right? I can look in the mirror and be like, okay, that's all I got, right? And then look at my wife and be like, babe, this is as good as it gets. I don't, I don't have anything else. There's literally, I, I, this is it. Best of luck, right? This is it. The mirror doesn't lie. Even uh, Snow White. Now I'm gonna get to, here we go. I'm gonna get some more in the room. Snow White, right? The e equal queen or whatever it was looks into the mirror and says, "Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all?" And the mirror's like, "This is gonna be awkward. Um, I can't lie, and um, not you, right? Like." Can you please lie one time when I ask you who's the prettiest and you just say it's you one time? And the mirror's like, this is awkward, but it's not you, right? Mirrors don't lie. Look at James chapter 1. That's what it says in James chapter 1. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he does. You see, it presents the Bible as a mirror. And if we look at it, it's going to be like, this is who you really are. Good, bad, or an ugly, or indifferent. That's me. And what happens is, because we're afraid of what it's going to say, we don't look in it. If we do and it says something to us, we want to walk away and forget what it said. I don't want to be held accountable. I don't want to know where I fall short of the glory of God. I don't want to be this label sinner thing. That sounds so ugly, and I don't want, and so... If I'll just look less in that, then I can feel better about my lifestyle and the choices that I'm making. But if I look in that, then... Uh, it doesn't lie. But here's the greatest thing about it. It's not just that. It says it's perfect. This is the standard. But it's also the law of what? How can that be freeing? How is it that I can look at something like a mirror and go, ooh, 
I've got some blemishes, I've got some imperfections, I've got some things that are not quite right, and that be liberating for me. Because not only does this word tell me exactly who I am, it tells me exactly who Jesus is. Because in this same word, it tells me where I fall short, and it tells me about Jesus who lived the perfect sinless life that I could not. And this Jesus who died in my place and suffered and substitutionary atonement for me, that now by faith, by the grace and mercy he provides, I can be seen differently by God when he looks at me. That's liberating. That's freeing. The gospel changes and transforms. I have to look at it, though. It is a law of liberty for me. Everyone has a standard. Are you going to surrender to your standard or what the Bible says? Are you going to base your beliefs off of experiences or feelings or the truth of God's word. So you don't understand, I've really felt, I have people tell me all the time, I really feel like God wants me to do something. I go, God wants you to do that? I do. I feel a peace at doing something contrary to what he said. Yeah, but I had a, com- I prayed and God gave me a peace to do something contrary to his word. Mm-mm. God never changes. Can I say something to you? I know we just met, and this might be the last time I ever get invited to come here, so let me say it. (laughs) If you feel one way, and the Bible says something different, one of those things is wrong. And it's not this. Okay? I need a source of truth that's more trustworthy than what I experience or what I feel. Thirdly and lastly, because I know I'm up against it. I don't even know what time I'm supposed to be done, so here we go. (laughs) The word of God is more trustworthy than what we think or say. The word of God is more trustworthy than what we think or say. This is the most important part. I got to do this the quickest. Here we go. This is what he says. Knowing, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. These are not men's thoughts. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. These are not man's words. But men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These are not men's thoughts. These are not men's words. They were carried along and moved. It's the same word talking about uh, driving a boat that puts up sails and the wind drives it to its destination or a a leaf in a stream. It's going to go where the stream takes it. You say, show me. All right, let me, let me show you a few things very quickly. Now, I told the, the, the young lady doing slides, uh, we've got a few. Here we go. You ready? Come with me. Notice what it says. Let's read this together. Uh, I mean, I'll read it for you, but let's look at it together. Exodus chapter 4. Moses said to the Lord, I'm my Lord God. I am not eloquent. Here's a problem. He said, Moses, I want you to go talk to Pharaoh. Moses is like, you got the wrong dude. I don't speak. I'm not so good at this speaking thing. Here's what he says. Neither in the past nor since I've spoken to you. He's like, there's zero time in which I've been good at this. Before you or after you, I'm still not good at this thing. He said, who made your mouth? Mm. God's flexing a little bit. I'm sorry. Who made your mouth? You did. Yeah, that's right. I did. Who makes him mute or deaf or sing or binds not I? The capital L-O-R-D. So you just go... I will be with your mouth and teach you what you will speak. So all of a sudden, it's not about Moses or his mouth. God's putting his words in Moses' mouth. You see this? Okay. Now look at Jeremiah chapter 1. This is for all the young people in the room. Jeremiah said the same thing. God, behold, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a youth. I'm too young. I can't be speaking. I can't be doing this thing. The Lord said to me, don't you tell me I'm only a youth. I love God's just like, I am... When are people just going to listen to do what I told them to do? I can't. Okay. Whoever I send you, you're going to go. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Don't be afraid. I am with you to deliver you. The Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And he said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. We're seeing a pattern forming here. First, one of our founding fathers of Moses, now prophets. I have words being put into their mouth. Notice Mark chapter 12. What about kings, prophets and priests and kings? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord. So now all of a sudden when David's writing these beautiful psalms, that some of them was read here, the Holy Spirit was speaking through David when he wrote those things. Now we're starting to see a pattern. Acts chapter 1 verse 16, it says this, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled. The scripture, 
What's scripture? Which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand. How? By the mouth of David. So now we have scripture. We have Holy Spirit by the mouth of David. Now we're really starting to see something materialize here. One more, Acts chapter 28, it says this. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. Whether it be prophet, priests, kings, forefathers, there was still the same mechanism. They spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them words to say. Now, we don't seem to have a problem when we say the prophets spoke for God, that God spoke through the mouths of the prophets, but God didn't speak through the pens of the apostles. It's the same mechanism. It's the same power of the Holy Spirit producing the words of God, whether it be through the mouths of Moses Prophets, kings like David, apostles, God gets it to his desired end. My son's coming back from camp next week, and I'm excited for that. He's been working at uh, Snowbird. I understand that Brody Holloway came up here and preached about half a year ago. I'm grateful that the walls are still here because that guy can straight get it. So Andrew, my son's been working with Brody at Snowbird all summer. He's coming back next week. We wanted to go see him because mama's here, and even though he's our sophomore in college, 19-year-old, it's still her baby, right? That's, all mamas understand this, right? So we got to go see my baby, and so we're going to go. Well, we're not staying at the camp, so are there any sort of... Anybody ever heard of Verbo, right? So I'm like, there's got to be something down there we can rent. Cool little cabin, something, be nice. And so uh, John G. went down there with our student ministry that went to camp, and he had found a place. So he goes, man, you should check this thing out on Verbo. So I go to Verbo, and I check this thing out. And it is a nice little cabin, two-bedroom little thing. And you start reading the reviews. And the reviews are like, five-star, greatest place I've ever seen in my life. And you love the views, and the kitchen's amazing, and fully stocked, and all these reviews. You look at the pictures, and it's like, oh, this is breathtaking. Is this on the side of you know, some mountain somewhere, and look at this creek behind the thing, and the bathroom look, I mean, huge, you know, we, an entire family could walk into that shower, like, this thing looks amazing. What I don't know is if family members put these reviews in there, right? Cousin Joey puts five stars in there. Grandma's putting one in. She's like, I don't even know what to put. Mom, just put that you liked it. Put you love the bathroom. I love the bathroom. Make sure to click the, the fifth star, the one at the end. Click. I don't know. It's possible. And these pictures, Google produces a lot of great pictures of log cabins and mountains. Right? I have no idea whether or not these reviews and these pictures are the actual place. Right? I don't know what to do. However, Johnji, my friend, had been there. And he's like, I'm telling you, it's legit. So I can't trust the words of these reviews or these pictures and these images, but there's something about John G. that I trust a little bit more. And he's like, I'm telling you, it's a nice place. Jesse will like it. You'll be fine. You should go and get this place. So why do I say that? This is not a collection of 66 positive verbo reviews. These are not people that had a good experience with Jesus and wrote about it. These are people that wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit to write the words that God wanted to have down to protect them so that you and I could have a copy of these things today. Let me say this. I, I'm, let me go ahead and invite the worship team to come up here and join me because I have gone a little over time. I want to say this. I want to say this. At the end of the day, I believe this. The God who created the universe spoke the world into existence. He used words. God said, let there be light. There was light. The same God that spoke the universe into existence also sent his son. And Jesus is described in John 1.1 1, 1, as the word was with God, and the Word was God, in 114, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the Word made flesh, lived a perfect, inerrant, infallible life here on this earth, died on the cross in our place for our sins, rose again three days later, is exactly who he claimed to be to do, exactly what he came to do, 
rose again, ascended to heaven, is coming back again because he promised he would. And if God has said it, you can take it to the bank. God used words to create the universe. He sent his word made flesh to live perfectly among us. He has every ability to get us a copy of his words that are true and trustworthy today. So I come back to this statement. Here's where it's at. Here's where it's at. If the word of God is inspired, if that's true, either God's words or they're not, if the word of God is inspired, it is inerrant. Why? Because they're God's words, not men's. And God is holy. If the Bible's inspired, it is inerrant. If it's inerrant, it's infallible. If they're God's words, they're true words. If they're true words, they're trustworthy. If they're infallible, then they're authoritative. Because I am not. I am errant and fallible. So it has more authority over me than my thoughts and words. If it's authoritative, then it's sufficient for anything that God would have me to do. And if it's sufficient for anything I need, it should be a relevant part of my life. I want to maybe reintroduce you to this book. Some of you here today, maybe you're visiting. I want to introduce you. Listen, we're not worshipers of the word of God. We worship the God of the word. I'm trying to point you to the author is what makes this true and trustworthy. God wrote a book. And, and you don't necessarily need a Bible today. You need Jesus. I want to introduce you to his word, but more importantly, this is to point us to the God of. And maybe you're here today and you're still struggling with life and faith. And instead of giving you some assignments, listen, you need Jesus. And maybe today's the day that the word that was made flesh, that lived perfectly, that died in your place, that by faith alone today, that you would give your life to him. Just like this young man that got into the water today. A lot of you in this room, you're like, Chris, I've been there. I, listen, I love Jesus. I gave my life to him. I do have that testimony. I surrendered. He's Lord of my life. Can I ask you a question? Honestly, when's the last time you got in here? Not in a Sunday school class, not just on Sunday morning. Let's t can we talk about Monday through Saturday and you in this book? If the one that loves you enough to die for you and you gave your life to him has written you something that is true and trustworthy, authoritative, sufficient, relevant to your life, how are you doing with your time here in it, honestly? I want to encourage you to spend more time. So this morning, I'm going to come down here. What I have, what we have what Oasis is providing for you is some of you have been like, what's, what's underneath there? You're like, are we doing communion today? What is underneath here? And I think what's underneath here. I'm going to pull this off. You ready? This isn't a magic trick. Here we go. Here's copies of the word. If you don't have one, come, take, eat. It is free. There are student Bibles on this side. So all the students in here, young and old. Here's a student Bible here, and over here is a study Bible. Listen, they didn't just grab, this is what I love about Oasis and Brady. They, they do it well here. They didn't just grab some, some Bibles. They grabbed study Bibles for you. If you don't own a study Bible, they're here for you to take, for you. I don't know if I'm paying for these later, but I know at some point. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Um, some of you need to take this time to stand and sing. Some of you need to come and get recommitted. This young man said, I rededicated my life to the Lord. Will you rededicate your time to spending in his word? He wrote a book for you. It should be relevant to your life. I want to encourage you to do that. So whether or not you need to come and pray, there's going to be some families, some couples that will be standing up. If you're like, I want to grab a copy and then, and then I need some accountability. Will you pray for me that I get back into the word of God? I don't know where this message finds you, but I pray right now you'd be obedient to whatever God wants to do. Let me pray for you this morning. God, thank you so much for your word. It is true. It is trustworthy. And we want to rededicate our time being spent in it. Whether I'm reading a chapter of Proverbs each day, whether I just jump into the Gospel of Matthew as it's being taught here on Sunday mornings, wherever you would have me, God, I, I want to recommit my time spending with you in a very quiet place on a regular basis in your word. 
we are spoiled with how many versions of the Bible we can have at our fingertips. It is not a lack of access to it. It's just a lack of my desire to spend time with you. God, I pray today you would move in our hearts whether we make our chairs an altar, whether we come to this altar and grab a Bible and commit it to you. If you need us to move, then God help us to move. If we need to pray with somebody for accountability, um, if we need to grab our spouse by the hand and say, I'm sorry that our family hasn't been doing this together, I don't know. But I pray for individuals, families, leaders in this church to say, God, forgive me for putting a microphone around my face and doing something from a stage, and I do not spend time on your word. God, whatever you need to do, we want to get close to you, not because we worship the Bible, but we worship you. So God, inhabit the praises of your people as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.